Hello everybody. Welcome to my channel, Homeopathic Super Sessions by Dr. Jagos. Today we will be doing Richard Hughes' the ninth lecture, the administration of the similar remedy. In the previous two lectures, we have seen how to obtain the similar remedy. The similarity can be obtained on generic, specific, and individual level. So, in the last two chapters, we have seen how to obtain a similar remedy on the basis of the generic, specific, and individual level. Generic meaning on common symptoms, specific meaning on characteristic symptoms, and on, and on the individual level meaning the totality of the symptoms. Hence, which is naturally based on characteristics. Hence, once obtained, it has to be administered. So therefore, once you know how to select a remedy, then the next step comes to administer it. This can be done by keeping the rule in mind of a single simple medicine, rarely, constitutionally and minutely. So now we will discuss the above mentioned point. That is, we will discuss a single simple medicine, rarely, constitutionally and minutely. However, the point minutely, Dr. Richard Hughes hasn't mentioned anything about in lecture number nine because he's given it in much in length in the next lecture, that is lecture number 10. So regarding the first point of a singly administration of a remedy, Hanneman had a strong aversion to polypharmacy, which was prevalent during the time. As you all know, during Hanneman's time, different systems of medicine were there. Each one of them gave more than one remedy that is known as polypharmacy. So, in an essay in 1797, are the obstacles to simplicity and certainty in practical medicine insurmountable? Here he said the different results were obtained with a single remedy. So Hanneman was of the view that if you want to obtain good results or a definite results, then a single remedy will do the job. He furthermore states that in his practice, he has always used a single simple remedy. He had never repeated the dose as long as the medicine was acting favorably. Furthermore, Hanneman says that after giving the single simple remedy, he had never repeated the dose as long as the medicine was acting favorably. That means what? As long as the medicine showed a good action on the individual, it was completely exhausting its action nicely and nicely, or it had acted very favorably. So as long as the medicine is acting, Dr. Hanneman said that do not repeat the dose. He also adds that he never gave a second remedy until he had a clear idea about the operation of the first. So therefore, Dr. Hanneman said that he also never gave a second remedy immediately until and unless he had a crystal clear idea about the first prescription or how the first remedy had acted. However, during Hanneman's time, many mixtures were administered or medicines were combined in different proportions so as to increase the additional power. That is from 1812 to 1843. As you all know, that many systems of medicine were there and they used to use polypharmacy and they used to give a mixture. A mixture consists of many remedies which were mixed together in order to make it more potent or to increase its power. However, for homeopathy, the single remedy was always the rule of the end. Whereas in homeopathy, it was just the opposite that we always used to use in homeopathy a single simple remedy. Hence, for chemical compounds, which on analysis have a complex constitution, these drugs are also included when they are grouped. So therefore, he says that those, com those chemical compounds, which on analysis had a complex constitution, that means what more than one of the chemicals present in them, they were also included in the proving. For example, calcium arsenate, zinc phosphide, etc. So this calcium arsenate was proven on a healthy human being, though they had a complex constitution of calcium and arsenate. Regarding the alteration of remedies, Hanneman says that it interferes with action when two remedies are administered. So Hanneman wasn't in favor of giving alteration of remedies because he says that if you alter two remedies, naturally the action of one remedy will interfere with the action of the second remedy. And in April number 169 to 170, he explains in detail. Out here, he says that when we take the totality into consideration and it is not covered completely by one medicine, but we have two medicines, one acting some symptoms and the other acting on some other symptoms. So therefore he says that in a case where we take the totality and we cannot find one remedy covering the full totality, but 
we have come to a conclusion of two remedies one remedy having a similarity to one part of the totality and the second remedy having a similar having a similarity to the second part of, or to the remaining part of the totality therefore if you administer one medicine then we must do a fresh examination of the case and administer the other remedy is still indicated so therefore it says that if two remedies are indicated see which one is most suited and you administer that and after you call the patient for a follow up you have to always re examine the case and administer the other remedy if still indicated that means you have after two remedies you have given the first remedy patient has come for a follow up after 7 to 15 days you have re examined the case and the second remedy is given if the totality of the second remedy is still present in the case then only you give it otherwise you do not give it thus in each case we must freshly examine the symptoms and see if the previous remedy still holds good so therefore dr animan says or he reminds us repeatedly saying that in every case we must always freshly examine the symptoms and see if the previous remedy still holds good so if you want to give the previous remedy see if the symptoms of the previous remedy are still there or if it holds good then only you can give it if not the second best medicine must be administered based on the change symptom he said if the first remedy still doesn't hold good or there are no symptoms of the first remedy it indicates that the totality has changed so the change totality is there naturally you have to find out the second best remedy which will cover up the change totality that can be done by taking the totality into consideration after freshly examine the case and administering a new remedy based on the totality thus hanneman advocated the group to precede sponge of aconite and sometimes follow it up with ipat self however one of his ardent followers one boning usain advocated a system to give five powders in succession so in group hanneman's dr hanneman's follower one bor boning usain he said to give five powders in succession for group so what what are those five powders it contain aconite sponja hepa sponja and hepa so in this order you have to give it for group other examples are of prepare milaris where he advocated the alteration of aconite with coffea so this was true for acute diseases regarding chronic disease of fixed character in the first three edition of organon he advocated alteration of remedies so in in the initially dr hanneman in his editions of organon in the first three editions he had advocated the alteration of remedies in the second edition the use of mercury and sulfur was done syphilis and sora coincided so he said that in the second edition the use of mercury and sulfur was done why because the the miasms of syphilis and sora they both were present in the third edition the use of thuja or nitric acid when psychosis was present so in the third edition he said that the use of thuja or nitric acid was 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 given when the psychotic miasm was was present in his last edition the possibility of having to repeat sulfur many times he advises to interpose a dose of ipar sulfuris thus the occasional use of alteration of remedies in hanneman's practice led into some ardent followers herring gross rumel hartman agedi and hitch dr drisdale in the international homeopathic convention in 1881 showed that alteration of remedies would revive the susceptibility which otherwise seem to have been exhausted so drisdale also he said that he also used this alteration of remedies and he gave a justifiable reason saying that the susceptibility by altering the remedies the susceptibility which was exhausted would again be activated he also cautions us by saying that the remedies which were altered must not have an antidotal effect so Christian also said that uh, that whatever remedy you give in alteration, you see that it doesn't antidote the first remedy. Richard Hughes's view on alteration remedies was that he disagreed with the view. He said, if we carefully examine the case, we can find a third remedy that would cover up the full totality and uh, avoid the use of alteration of two remedies. So Richard Hughes also he disagreed. agreed he disagreed with the view of alteration of remedies he said that in a case where you come up with two seemingly similar remedies one covering one totality the other one covering the other totality or the remaining totality do not use both these drugs but retake the case again carefully examine the case and you will find only one drug 
which will cover up the full totality. Nevertheless, if you want to alternate two remedies, they should have been proven in alteration. So, however, he says that if you want to have or if you want to give two rem remedies in alteration, then you have to prove it in order to prove your point. Otherwise, you cannot administer it. He further says in definite diseases with urgent complications are met with alteration of remedies rather than by the change of remedies. So he furthermore says that in diseases which are of urgent uh, nature or they are complicated or they want immediate relief in such instances uh, you can give alteration of remedies. Why? Because the urgency is there to uh, to mitigate the disease rather than by the change of remedies. However, a single remedy has been the rule in its entire practice and only adequate the use of alteration remedies in some complex cases. So, as you all know, in the previous slide, I said that he disagreed with the view, but he said that one exception was there that in urgent cases or in cases which were complicated, which required in, uh, immediate relief, then he said, alteration of remedies could have been advocated. But in his whole life or the entire practice, he has always used a single remedy. And he had put aside this alteration of remedies only for some complex cases. Now, the second rule for administration of simple remedies is that it should be given rarely. Hanneman in 1796 speaks of monopharmacy and says that he has never repeated the dose until action of the former has ceased. So in 1796, Hanneman introduced homeopathy and he said that you only have to give a single simple remedy that is monopharmacy. And he again reminds us and he says that he has never repeated the dose until the action of the former has ceased. So he says that you or in his practice, he had never repeated the dose until the action of the first remedy had stopped or is completely exhausted. In the medicine of experience and the organon, the second dose should always be given after the first has exhausted its action. So in this book, medicine of experience and also in the organon, he has also mentioned that the second dose only should be given after the first has exhausted its action. That means what the first remedy you have given or the first dose of the first remedy what you have given, it has completely exhausted its action. It, is, it, it, it cannot do more good for the patient. So in such instances, the second dose can be given. The more liberal school of homeopaths used to frequently repeat the dose in hyperacute cases such as cholera. But the more liberal school of homeopaths, they used to frequently repeat the doses, especially in hyperacute cases of cholera. Richard Hughes says that the single dose and diseases were insufficiently studied. Richard Hughes also says that regarding single doses that they were not very well studied or still more research has to be done or they were insufficiently studied. The debate goes on whether to give a single dose or succession of smaller doses until some effect has been produced or to repeat the doses at regular intervals. So because the study was insufficient, there was a debate going on whether to give a single dose or you give many smaller doses until some effect has been produced or repeat the dose at regular intervals. That is every day, once at bedtime or once in the morning or or one dose every week, one dose every month, and so on and so forth. Thus, to make it clear, in acute diseases, we give the smaller doses in succession till some effect is produced. So, in acute diseases, is saying that the smaller doses are given in succession till some effect is produced. Whereas, in chronic cases, we have to repeat the dose at regular intervals. Thus, in short, you have to see the reaction which is produced. So, if it is deficient, then repeat the medicine. If it's excess, stop the medicine. To sum it up, whenever the case admits, give the remedy rarely. So basically regarding this point of a medicine to be given rarely, it will depend upon the reaction. Okay, if excessive medicine, excessive reaction is there, you stop the medicine, the deficient reaction is there, you have to repeat the medicine. It will all depend upon the case in hand. In, in an acute disease, he said you have to repeat more, in succession in order to get an effect and in chronic disease repeat it at regular intervals. The third rule he says that for the admission of remedy is that it should be given constitutionally. That it should be chosen from the totality of symptom. So therefore in order to give it constitutionally 
you have to naturally choose it from the totality of symptoms. The mode of administration into a system is comparatively unimportant. So it says that after you have taken the totality, after you, you have taken the concentration of an individual and you have formed the totality, in which mode you administer the remedy is practically unimportant. It can be given by hypodermic injection as for occasional use by Kafka. So Kafka said that you could give a hypodermic injection. It could be absorbed by the cutaneous surface or, for the, or by the rectal mucosa. So it can be given by this method also. But the most widely used method is injection to the mouth or the oral route is the most commonly used method. The next question which comes up is that of local applications. So is it, is it desirable in homeopathy? Animal strongly forbade the use of local applications. He was of the opinion that if local applications were allowed, it would interfere with the pathology. So therefore, Hanneman totally was against local applications. He said that if you would apply a local application, it would interfere with the, with the uh, disease process which goes on in the interior of the organism, that is the pathology. The disease would be driven into the most interior, affecting the vital organ necessary to maintain life. So if you'd apply a local application, what would happen? The disease would travel from the periphery to the center, from less important organs to the more to the, to the more vital organs, or from the exterior to the interior. The cause had to be taken care of, which was hidden in the interior in the form of myosins. So what was the cause? The cause of the disease lies interior, in the interior of the organism or the interior of the man, which is in the form of myosin, the sora, the psychosis, or the syphilitic mass. Dr. Dudgeon, in his lectures, pages 1516 and 565, makes two important exceptions as made by Hanneman. So he said that the use of arnica, rustox, arsenic, or heated alcohol is useful for bruises, strains, and burns, respectively the use of puja in old condylomatas. Bruises, strains and local injuries occur in the otherwise healthy person and are of primary local in nature. So therefore he says that some exceptions he has given Dr. Dungeon in his lecture as well as even Dr. Hanneman agreed. And he had said that these bruises, strains or local injuries which occur otherwise in a healthy person are primary local in nature. That means what? They they are of a short time, they have occurred recently, and, and they are not affecting the vital force. They are termed as local maladies, where the vital force is primarily not affected. So the cause lies external. Because of that, you get a bruise, a strain, or a local injury, and the vital force has not been affected. So therefore, it is primarily local in nature. Whereas a true tonic disease will originate from within, and the vital force will get affected. But if it's a true chronic disease, as you all know, as I told you in the previous slide, that the cause lies internal, either in the form of the myosin, the sora, psychosis, or syphilis. So therefore, a true chronic disease will originate from within and the vital force will get affected. Hence, the remedy is chosen according to the totality of the symptoms. So in a true chronic disease, the cause lies internal. So therefore, you have to give an internal medicine in order to mitigate the disease that is the cause of the disease, that is the myosin, that is sora, syphilit, psychotic or the syphilitic myosin. Furthermore, the pathogenic action of the medicines was similarly induced when these were introduced into the body. So furthermore, it says that we know the disease producing action of the medicines when they were introduced into the healthy body. That is what we know the pathogenic action of the medicines. Hence, the percept of similia similis curenta could only be fully obeyed when the drug corresponding to the patient's morbid state was internally administered. So therefore, if you want to administer an internal malady, internal remedy, you have to take the totality of the symptoms, you have to use the law of similars, and then only you can give the patient the internal medicine in order to mitigate the cause of the disease. That is the three great myosin, sora, syphilis, and psychosis. The application of thuja to condylomata is quite another thing. So Richard Uchis says that the application of thuja to condylomata is also quite another thing. In the introductory essays on the chronic disease, page 106 on the first part of second edition, 1835, recommends the internal administration of thuja, 30, and nitric acid, 6. So in Hanneman's essay on the chronic disease, he recommends the internal administration of, of either thuja, thuja with nitric acid, both. 
it will be sufficient to remove both gonorrhea and condyloma at both psychosis without the necessity of an external application. So out here he says that it will, so why are two remedies to be given? Because they will remove both. Thuja will remove the, the, the gonorrhea and, and nitric acid would remove the condyloma without any external application. The only exception being in a old and stubborn cases of Fibwort, where the my pure juice expressed from the green leaves of abo white was applied. So the only exception is there that in old and stubborn cases of fig warts, fig warts the my pure juice expressed from the green leaves of abo white. Abo white meaning the tree of life that is the thuja. So that was applied locally. So why was it applied? He gives the reason saying that they were the dead results of the past process of psychosis which had no root in the system and hence could not be reached from within. So he says that after, in a case of what's after you have mitigated the internal cause, whatever the mechanism may be, these what's which still remain on the, on the body have no roots within. That means what? They do not have any internal cause and hence it cannot be reached from within. So therefore it has to be reached from outside. So therefore it has to best dealt with the local application of the remedy. It is important to note that the mother tincture was used for local application, whereas the interior internal use was done with a high attenuation, proceeding from smaller doses to larger ones. So therefore, he says that it is important to note that for the local application, you are putting the thuja mother tincture externally, whereas in internal use, you are, gi you are giving the potentized dynamized doses, gradually going from smaller doses to larger ones. However, the totality couldn't be ascertained. Hanneman objected the use of local application. So basically, you, you have to have the totality or the correct totality. If you cannot find the totality, then the administration of local application is totally not allowed. Why? Because you will suppress the disease. It will go from the less vital organs to the more vital organs from the periphery to the center. Thus, to conclude, whenever the affection was a local one from the beginning, he was in complete favor for the use of topical application, for the topical use of the indicated remedy. So therefore, in short, the conclusion is that whenever any local affection is there and it was local from the beginning, that it had no roots internally, then only you can use a local application. Or if the local uh, eruptions had, after the administration of the internal remedy, the myosins have been taken care of, and the remnants remain on the surface of the body without having any roots internally, then also you can use the local application. Any affections which are local from the beginning, like bruises, strains, burns, wounds, stings, various forms of conjunctivitis, especially prevalent ones and malignant pustules caused by inoculation, local applications can be used. So these are the examples which he is giving. Also can be used in cases where it involves a constitutional secondary uh, where it, it, it involves a constitution secondary, secondary slice stomatitis, esophagitis, and gastritis. Thus, we are following the Hanimanian method. At times, there are cases where in the lesions at first is due to some internal malady and now have become local only. So there are cases in which the lesions were due to some internal malady and now have become local. That, that, that means I've told you that the internal cause you have taken care of after the intercourse has been mitigated, the, the, the remnants still remain on the body and they only become local without any internal roots. They have now become extra vital and are purely local as Hanneman's own condylomata and require topical treatment accordingly. So they have become extra vital. That is what the vital force is not involved in this. And as Hanneman's own condylomata require tropical treatment accordingly. Examples stated are chronic otoria, laryngitis, and winter cough with dyspnea, that is chronic bronchitis. Thus, those diseases having a constitutional root, the remedies corresponding to the totality must be used. So, therefore, those diseases which have a constitutional root, that means what? The cause of the disease lies internally in the form of myosins. So, for that, you have to use the totality and administer the remedy. However, instances are there in such cases the internal remedy along with the local, local local applications are administered. So there are instances in which you are given the internal remedy and at the same time are giving the local uh, application also of the same remedy. So question is, are we acting wisely? 
Dr. Tanjil quotes certain Gupta authorities in favor of this limited use of the method. Dr. Gross advocates lacases, silicia, and rust as external application to ulcers on the leg. Dr. Hammer Rath uh, carried out this method on a very extensive scale. He used the same remedy locally, which according to Homer principles was to be given internally. He says astonished, he says astonished at the results had he obtained with the patient of the eye. So Hammermath also, Hammerlath was also an, another gentleman who, who, who'd, uh, who advocated the external use of medicines along with the same medicine given internally and says that he was astonished by the use of results, especially in the patient of the eye. He later on also got good results in other parts of the body like the ears, nose, mouth and inner genital region. He gained more success than employing the internal remedy alone. So Hammermath who was a fellow who gave more of external applications to a number of diseases affecting the ears, the eyes, the nose, the mouth and the inner, and the inner genital region with much success. So he gained more success than employing the internal remedy alone. He used remedies in the first trituration or dilution by adding lard or water as required. So therefore, he used the remedy in the first trituration or dilution by adding lard, lard is animal fat or water as, as and when required. Richard Hughes thinks that this method requires further concentration and trial. So Dr. Hughes says that this method by Hammermath by only using the external applications where he, has, where he has got wonderful results, he said that this method still requires further consideration and trials. Dr. Hammerath method doesn't follow Hanemanian concept. So you just says that the method adopted by Dr. Hammerath, Hammerath doesn't follow the Hanemanian concept. Thus, by using local applications where the cause lies internal where the cause lies, internal metastasis of the disease takes place. So therefore, if you only give local applications, the disease is pushed from the, from the, from the uh, periphery to the center, less vital organs to the more vital organs, or there's internal metastasis of the disease taking place. Internal metastasis meaning what? The internal ramification of the disease. Forcible suppression of eruption on the head resulted in affection of the brain, eyes, and the ears. So you give an example that if you forcibly suppress eruptions on the head, the disease went more into the deeper organs like the brain, eyes and the ears. So that's all what he wants to say about this chapter 9. So in my YouTube channel, I've also in introduced recently YouTube shots. It is a new concept of sure short homeopathic remedies in cases seen in day-to-day -day practice. Short and concise videos of maximum 30 seconds duration I have put. It will tell you important homeopathic remedy or remedies. It gains more success as a homeopathic physician. You will gain more success as a homeopathic physician and you also gain confidence in prescribing. So in this YouTube shots, a small, a small 30 second video has been put up by in diseases seen in day-to-day -day practice where I've got good results with these remedies. So you also, you also can try it and obtain good results. So please do subscribe to my YouTube channel the channel related exclusively to Organon. It's easy to understand and remember. It contains all important topics of UG and PD syllabus. It has up to date around 33 videos, important tips how to crack the examinations, viva questions, theory questions, and much more. So please, thank you for listening to this video. And if you like this video, please do subscribe, share, like, comment, and forward.